Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Seymour in the Word. This is my lovely wife, Barbara Seymour, and my name is Jerry, and we welcome you to Seymour in the Word of God tonight. We are in Acts chapter 17. We're going to start around verse 10, so if you'll open your Bible and prepare your heart. Yes. Pull up a chair. Welcome the Holy Spirit. Make place for him, and he will show up. I challenge you. Pull up a chair. Ask Holy Spirit to come and join you, and he's promised he'll do it. Yes. And he does every time. So He's good like that. He is so good like that. He's good like that. And he shares wisdom. He shares Jesus. He shares yes. the love of the Father every time he comes in just conforms us to the image of Christ. So Acts chapter 17, verse 10, let's pray. Father, we welcome you. We thank you that your word says, if two or three are gathered together, that you would be in the midst. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Malachi chapter 16, chapter 3, verse 16. It says, when brothers are dwell together and Start sharing about the good things of the Lord. The Lord makes an account in the books in heaven. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we're going to just keep those angels busy. Father, we're going to keep them with a sharp pen, writing the accounts of where we share your good nature towards us. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit right now. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come in, Holy Spirit. Reveal Jesus. Reveal the Father. Let the anointing on the word of God flow through this channel tonight. We prepare our hearts to receive. We prepare. We make place. We position ourselves. We position ourselves in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Lord, so tonight, if you are, since you are hearing this and watching, a little of the teaching tonight is going to be encouragement for you, but it's also will be, as Barbara says, preaching to the choir because you're already here. I challenge you at the beginning of this teaching to write down a famous quote in our lives. It says, I am responsible for my own edification. Okay. So this teaching starts tonight with a declaration and a disclosure that each one of us is responsible for our own edification. So let's go. Let's look at this. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. I want you to read that for us. All right. As the brethren and the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble minded than those in Sethel. Thessalonica. I don't know why that was hard for me to say right there. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true. Keep going. Many of them therefore believed, along with the number of prominent Greek women and men. All right. So let's look back and we see in verses five through eight that Paul and Silas were held and hosted in the house of Jason. And during the night, Jason and the brothers there strategized a escape for Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy, and they escaped Thessalonica with their lives. They ran during the night. How far did they run? They went 
they travel for at least as the crow flies the the distance from Thessalonica to Berea is 45 miles but obviously that is not the straight this the straightest way is 45 miles and it says that they travel during the night yes so on the notes you will see a a link to Paul's second missionary journey and you can see the route that they are taking from Thessalonica to Berea. Berea. So we talked last week as it was Paul's custom. What is our custom? What are traditions? What will people say about us that other than Jerry drinks coffee every morning, what will be said of me? What are my customs? So it was Paul's customs. And he went to Berea looking for and found a group of Jewish believers. Paul, by his custom, followed his heart to his fellow Jewish brothers, no matter he was persuaded, no matter what they did, that no matter if they rejected, didn't matter if they persecuted, it didn't matter what they did. And we see this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Which says, and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I can't believe you did that. Hold on just a second. Just leave that right there. We're having technical difficulties. We're having big finger difficulties. Thank you. We're back. Okay. We had big finger issues on a touchscreen computer. Okay. All right. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And he also restates this in verse nine, Romans 2, 9 and 10. He says to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And this is Paul's custom. He goes first to the Jew and then to the Greek. We see time and time again that this was his custom. Did you want to talk about that? Sure, sure. So the custom, Jerry talked about this some last week, that it was Paul's custom to go to the synagogue. So it must have been a very important tradition because in the book of Acts alone, Paul going to the synagogue, I did a search for going to the synagogue, it appears 12 times in the book of Acts. That's significant. That's a custom. That is a custom that indicates a custom. And two more times, it says that he was just looking for a place to share and to teach. So in your notes, I've listed the 14 places in the scriptures. And I would encourage you to be a Berean and look those up and study those places. Mm -hmm. But it must have been such a custom to Paul that he could identify with Jeremiah the prophet. What did Jeremiah the prophet say in Jeremiah 20, verse 9? If I say, I will not mention, I will not make mention of the Lord or speak any more in his name. If Jeremiah would say that, it, in his mind and in his heart, it is as if there were a burning fire shut up in his bones, and I am weary of enduring and holding it in. I cannot contain it any longer. Paul must have felt exactly like Jeremiah felt. He could not contain it, no matter what the consequences were, no matter what the persecution 
was, no yeah, matter yeah. jail, no matter shipwreck, he was persuaded, he was convinced, it was fire shut up in his bones, and he had to share the gospel. This was his custom. This was his tradition. This was habitual. It was also the mandate on his life. Mm -hmm. He could not get away from it. All right. Verse 11 says, now there were more fair-minded, noble. Now these, the Bereans. The Bereans. These were more noble-minded, fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. And that they received the word with all readiness. They searched the scriptures yearly. Uh, what? Daily. <laughs> <laughs> to find out for themselves whether these things were so. I am responsible for my own edification. Talk to us about these Bereans, Barbara. This scripture is so amazing to me, so interesting to me, that Paul would take the time, Luke would take the time to point out these precious people in Berea. And let me tell you, these were Jews. Right. These were Jewish people in Berea. They, so they were just like all the other places that Paul had gone, but they were open-minded. They were noble-minded. They were inquisitive. They studied the scripture. For themselves. So let me show you four characteristics of these people. They were more noble-minded. They listened with great earnestness. They examined the scriptures day after day, and they were determined if what they heard was truth. They were not going to continue to listen to or believe a lie. They wanted to know if it lined up for themselves. Come they on. weren't going to take somebody else's word. Right. Um, the Amplified Bible includes Jews. And so that's where we get the um, indication that they were Jews. Mm -hmm. The Amplified Bible also says that they were better disposed. Now, Jerry, you looked up the word disposed. Disposed as in the... Not, not disposable right. as in throwaway, but they were better disposed as in... The Oxford American Dictionary. The first definition, number one, dispose, D-I-S-P-O-S-E, to make willing, incline oneself, prepare a suitable place. So they love the word so much and love hearing it that they positioned themselves, they made a place for themselves to be able to receive what was being taught. They prepared a suitable place. They prepared a suitable place. They prepared themselves. That's right. That is mm -mm -mm. significant to me. Are we prepared to receive the word of God? Sometimes I'm not. Just to be honest, sometimes I'm not prepared to receive it. Sometimes, sometimes. my mind is in 10 different places. Sometimes my heart is in multiple different places and is not centered, not focused, not ready to tuned receive. In. But yet the nobility of the Jews in Berea was displayed not by their willingness to hear, but by their careful daily examination of the scripture. You're about to preach. They were noble because they searched it out. They qualified what someone was teaching them. And this can be a hard concept maybe for us Western Christians to hear, but a noble Christian today, and I thank everyone in this group and anyone listening to me on Facebook about right now, if you're taking the time to listen, I would say that you would be noble, mm -hmm. you know, and just the fact that you're listening, you're right. spending your time appropriately. But a noble Christian should listen skeptically and curiously. Come on. Well, we don't hear that preach, do we? We should listen skeptically and curiously. Listen intently to what is being taught 
by preachers and teachers, even here at Seymour and the Word. Podcast. Yes, on YouTube. Listen intently, but then study. Study out what you hear. Study out and examine the Bible to make sure that what you're hearing from that pulpit or on that YouTube channel Platform. or even here at Seymour and the Word is the truth. Man is not infallible. Man can, can mess up. Man can preach heresy mm -hmm. if they're not careful. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that what you hear is true and you can only do that by searching it out for yourself. When I was researching and studying this scripture, the Holy Spirit immediately took me to 2 Timothy 2.15. Come on. 2 Timothy 2.15 in the King James, for, for it is the only translation that uses this um, wording, says study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth Come on. the uh new american standard and the new international version uses words like be diligent to present or do your best to present they just don't seem to carry the same weight as study to show yourself approved mm -hmm. Well, there's something about that word study that puts that brings this whole idea of books and paper and pen and and research. And that's what the whole that's what we need to do with the word of God. Spend time with is spend time. Bible study is very important and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It takes work. It involves prayer. It involves reading, research. It involves diligently putting together those insights that you receive into a proper concept. Come on. Correctly handling the word of truth. Paul wanted Timothy to know by diligently applying himself in service that, he, that what he presented himself approved to God. He wanted to know that he was rightly handling the word of truth. There is in your notes, there are three different Greek um, tenses, three different Greek tenses to the verbs that are there in that scripture of 2 Timothy 2.15 that you can look at. And um, you need to talk about that. Oh, you want me to I, take time to talk about I, it? I, okay. I I, yes. This, the word, okay. I told you, I, I promised these people that you was going to preach. <laughs> <laughs> so the um word diligently means commitment to a decisive and effective choice you make the choice to study to be diligent you make the choice to sit down and study it's a commit it's a command to do this yes this is not negotiable right make this happen don't just try to do it make it happen but make it happen that's the word diligent and then the word present you know i've read this scripture and thought well this is talking about presenting himself approved to god well that's on the judgment day well if you look at the tense of the greek word that they use present is probably not a very good word in our english language but it's the best i guess that translators could come up with Present is a contemplated fact, actually, indeed, to accomplish, to effectively and successfully bring about that action. Make it happen. And I take that as it's current. Uh -huh. It's current. When you sit down with your Bible, or when I sit down with my Bible, I present myself at that time Come before on. God and saying, I want to be approved with what I'm reading here, what I'm getting, the insights I'm getting. I want you to approve what I'm learning. And so it's not in the by and by on the judgment day. Right, it's right now. It's this morning. It's this morning I when I sit myself. down, I present myself, approve to God, please make my workmanship here not to be ashamed. Make sure today when I present myself to God, 
that I handle your word correctly today, not just wait until glory in front of the judgment seat of God to be approved at that time. Anytime you sit down with your word, you ask the Holy Spirit to approve what you are reading, to approve what you're getting, to approve the insights that you're receiving so that you know that what you're getting is truth. The last word there is the word word. And that word is logos. Logos includes not only the word of God, written, the written word of God, but it also includes divine revelation. Mm -hmm. And so we want to accurately handle divine revelation. How many times have you heard people say, I got a word from God and you listen to it and you, you give them your, your time and your energy and you listen to it and you walk away, you go, that doesn't line up. That just doesn't line up with, with God's word. Mm -hmm. And so did they rightly present themselves? Did they rightly handle that Logos word Are to we... make sure that it lined up with the biblical word? So here's my challenge to you. How do you evaluate sermons and teachings? The people of Berea searched the scriptures for themselves to verify the message they heard. Always compare what you hear with what the Bible says. A preacher or teacher who gives God's true message will never contradict or explain away anything that's found in God's word. Come on and preach. They will accept it. Everything in God's word is acceptable and useful for the edifying of the body. I believe that's that's Timothy. written. That's in there, right? That's Timothy. <laughs> that's what Timothy says. That's right. I, I think it's in Second Timothy, actually. So when we were in, uh, in the result of all this study, the result of the listening, the result of them um, being noble-minded was that many of the Jews believed. Mm -hmm. The truth will bring about believers. Ooh, come on. The truth will shed light into false teachings. And the truth will be accepted. The truth will be, even when it's hard. Even when it's hard. The truth will be accepted. So when we were in, you want me to read my rewrite? No. Oh, yes. Read. Okay. Yes. So when we were in our associates program a year or so ago, we had to take scriptures like this, right. look at the Greek right. Come on. wording, and then rewrite it with the expository of the greek right with in today's vernacular well yes with a with the understanding that you got from the greek put it in your own words yes. would you please tell so, us about these bereans in your own <laughs> words barbara so here is verse 11 written with all this understanding now that we have from the greek words this is what i've written now, these Jews in Berea were more noble-minded, more curious, and more skeptical about the things of God than those in Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. For they listened, received, made themselves attentive to the teachings with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, 365 days a year, to determine whether the things Paul and Silas were constantly and repeatedly saying were true. Come on. They made a place for the truth. Can we do the same? So Timothy says that we might rightly divide the word of truth. Now, there's two people on this Zoom meeting right now that know that Jerry Seymour loves a sharp knife. And so we recently had somebody in our home as we were preparing food and they picked up one of our knives <clears throat> now we all have knives in our home but very few of them in your home and not all of them in my home but this one right here in particular has a razor edge on it and we warned the individual said be careful because we have sharp knives <laughs> Guess what? 
they weren't prepared for the sharpness of the knife. And it didn't take stitches. It just took a Band-Aid and, and they, they were good to go. But we have to be prepared and ready to receive an accurate word from God. A sharp word. A sharp word. And when a, when a sharp word comes that we don't like, if it lines up with the word of God, we still have to take the cutting. Help us, Jesus. I, uh, I said this one time to a dear friend that was being pruned. When God is doing surgery on you, hold still. Don't kick and don't squirm because the word of God is sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged two -edged sword, right? With the ability to divide the bone and the marrow, the bone and the marrow, even the intents of the heart are separated by the word of God. Now, the Bereans had prepared and disposed themselves to be in a position to receive the truth of God's word. Wow, what a compliment! Luke was traveling with Apostle Paul, and Luke writes such a, a poetic little one verse, two verses about the noble Jews in Berea. So this is our responsibility. We are responsible for our own edification, and we need to be prepared for the sharp word of the Lord. When it comes, we choose to receive it. Amen. That's good teaching right there. I don't care who says what. That is good stuff right there. Thank you. So uh, I did I did notice uh, in verse 14 that somebody in this group <laughs> that was traveling with Paul, maybe Silas, Luke, or Timothy, recognized a cycle that was going on. They went into a city. Paul preached in the synagogue. The Jews got fired up, chased them out of the city, and they ran for their life. Well, somebody recognized this cycle that was going on and says, hey, hang on, time out, time out. We're going to do things different here. And they, uh, they, they ran that time with their life. But check this out. The Bereans, the noble men of Berea, escorted Paul all the way to Athens. Let's read verse 14 and 15 again, please. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. So we see that the Bereans are somebody in the group took charge and said, uh, it's time for y'all to leave. This, we, we've seen this before, and this would be a good time for y'all to get out of here before the, the jailers show up. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, we skipped over verse 13. 13. What's 13? We can't skip over anything. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, hello, hello here they come again. The repeated cycle. The Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also. They came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowds. So the Bereans escorted Paul and Luke, and I can prove that Luke was with him. Paul and Luke made their way being escorted by the brethren at Berea all the way to Athens. Okay, I need to, can I say something about verse 13? Sure. Okay, so in my notes there at the bottom of page two, that's the amplified version of the verse that I just read. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And there in the brackets, it, it says, the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God concerning the attainment through Christ 
of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God was, was also preached by Paul at Berea. Come on. So you will see here, this is what the Jews from Thessalonica and all the other cities that they came and raised havoc. This is what they didn't like preached right. concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. According to a good Jew, salvation was only brought about by sacrifice. Religious people will not stop pushing their agenda. Come on, preach. They just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. And here the Amplified gives us a very clear description of exactly what Paul was teaching and why the Jews the religious Jews were protesting mm -hmm. sa eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. Was being preached. Was being preached. Right. Which goes directly against what traditional Judaism teaches. Sacrifice is the only way. Mm -hmm. Yet the dear brethren protected Paul and made sure he was safe. Now, I just want to say here that this was the first century church example of church security. They had full-blown church security here at the first century church of Berea. of Berea that they escorted Paul all the way to the sea, to the boat. No, they not only to the boat. Well, right. They went all the way to Athens. They, they escorted him, they made sure that the messenger of the gospel made it safely all the way. So let, let's just let's just think about that just a minute. Let's just go into that situation. Can you imagine these men, probably two, we'll just say two men, get chosen to escort Paul and Luke to Athens? What a testimony they came home with when they got what back to you? Berea. Let me tell you what, what Paul told us on the boat. Oh my goodness. I bet they was two fired up buddies when they got back to Berea to tell them of their experience of traveling with the apostle Paul and Luke all the way to Athens. <laughs> It's just interesting to me that this is the first time we hear, and as we go through the rest of this chapter, we don't hear of any of the Jewish persecution coming to Athens. <laughs> More, that's interesting. That's interesting. All the, I mean, how many other times have we read over and over? And, and uh, like 14. 14 <laughs> times we hear that the Jews from this city followed them and, and brought persecution and they brought the mob and they brought rude and crude and, and lewd men from the marketplace. And, and they came again. But guess what? They didn't follow them to Athens. I'd make a brother say, huh? <laughs> well you know in them days they didn't publish on the back of the boat where it was going when it left the port <laughs> unlike traveling today by trailways or greyhound there's a big advertisement right across the front of the windshield tells you exactly <laughs> where that where that bus is going they didn't have that back then so these guys may have followed them all the way to the port. They got, they, yep, they got on the boat, but we don't know where they went. Nope. So they yeah. lost, they lost track that may have been. That's the Jerry Seymour version. <laughs> we may find out later why they didn't go, but that's the Jerry Seymour version. Why persecution did not follow them. But let's just look and Paul, verse 16, keep reading. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, si Silas and Timothy, for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. There he is doing what's customary. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to have to read this. I can't do these. Words. Okay, verse 16. So, 18. 
verse 16, we see that Luke traveled with Paul <clears throat> because Luke gives us detailed understanding of, of the heart condition of Paul. He just didn't tell him he arrived in Athens. But look, okay. it tells us that Paul was concerned. He was anxious. He was provoked, provoked with anger because of the condition of the city. And he said it was full of idols. So we know Luke was traveling with him because he heard the heart of Paul. And he writes not just of the of the details of the event as translated or are conveyed to him, but he was there. He saw what was going on on the face of Paul. <clears throat> so Luke uh verse 18. I, I got it. Go on to verse 18. 17. Any reason right. synagogue and in the marketplace. Go ahead. Read 17 again for me, please. So when he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present, and also some of the Epicurean and the toxic philosophers were conversing with him. And some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others would say, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this teaching is, which you are proclaiming. So here now they're asking Paul for more teaching. Will you explain it? For we are bringing some strange things, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. We want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Okay, so I, I digress back to verse 16, and I got this out of the Amplified Bible, and it says, when Paul, while Paul was awaiting his partners in Athens, his spirit was grieved. He was aroused to anger because he saw the city was full of idols. Okay, so that's, so that, that's where I'm going with this, okay? So Barbara and I traveled to Athens in January of 2011. And from the port, from the harbor there, we walked. We did not have excursions. We didn't have other, we walked through the city of Athens. And as we approached the old city, you could see the Acropolis. You could see the Parathon as, as we went into the city. As we walked through the ruins of the Acropolis, you could see the Caradid porch there in the Acropolis, which is the memorial to the six most beautiful women in the Grecian world. We saw their, their efforts to recover and restore the uh, Parathenic Stadium, which was the original location of the Grecian Olympics. We walked through, we, we sat in the Areopagus, which is the arena at Mars Hill. We were there. We walked through this city with our mouths wide open because here we found ourselves at the center of the Grecian culture here 3,000 years later, and the city is still vibrant and they're restoring, and it was just amazing to walk through here because this was the birthplace of politics. Mm -hmm. This was the per birthplace of democracy. This was the first place of citizen rights. This was the 
the birthplace of Greek, Grecian architecture, which our architecture today is still being influenced by their technology, philosophy. How about calculus? They celebrated higher learning. We walk through this place with our mouths wide open, but Paul the apostle didn't see it this way. He walked through these same streets that we did. Okay, yeah, it was only 2,500 years previous to when we walked through it, but he didn't see it the same way. There was not the amazement and wonder that Barbara and I shared. Instead of celebrating the achievements of mankind, he mourned the failure of man's attempt to bring some sort of religion to satisfy man's depraved soul and satisfy. He saw the conglomeration of the most brilliant minds of the time, and we still celebrate these guys. Galileo, Aristotle, Paleo, Plato. Plato. They were in the streets. They were in the marketplace. He rubbed mm -hmm. shoulders with these guys. Or can we be like Paul? Instead of seeing the glitter, seeing the glamour, can we walk down the streets and mourn that they don't know Christ? They don't know the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They don't know. They have no hope. They have no hope. They got all the lights. They got all the glitter. They got the music, the entertainment but they have no hope. You see, in verse 17 and 18, Paul refused to accept the philosophy of what will be, will be. He didn't sit there mourning and bemoaning the fact that these philosophers, genius men of the time, didn't get it. No, he went into action. He used his God-given talent to convince, to address the situation. He used, he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Well, he was among the Greeks, and that's what he did. Well, he was in the marketplace, and he got audience with the popular. He got audience with those potentates. He got audience with men of authority. And what did he do? Well, what did they do? They asked for more. They asked for more. So these men were educated. Would we say that they were noble? I would say. They were definitely curious. Mm -hmm. They were definitely curious. And Paul, as was his tradition that we went through, he went right down the list, just like he had presented several times before to these, to this audience. So let's look and read on down through from verse 18 all the way down to 32 and see how Paul presented Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to the most educated, heady, high-minded, men of the Grecian culture in that day. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to start at verse 22. For the sake of time. Yeah. After being asked to share more because they were hearing something new in verse 21. In verse 22, it says, and Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observed that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Hallelujah. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I now proclaim to you. He got them at their point, at a point of connection. Right, right. The God who made the world and all the things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, 
Neither is he served by human hands as he needed, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one every nation of mankind to live all on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, that they should seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Hallelujah. For in him we live, we move, we exist, and even some of our own of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art or a thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he, if he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. Wow. Do you see the strategic concise way that Paul presents Jesus. He comes to them, he walks through their streets and finds the memorial or the idol or the position in place to the unknown God and says, let me tell you about this God that y'all don't know anything about. He comes to them exactly where they are. He doesn't preach down to them. He preaches up to them. He said, let me give you some education. These guys were all about education, education, education. And they wanted to know more. They came with itching ears to hear of a new philosophy. So Paul came and reasoned to them to discover and uncover and expose to them the understanding of the one true God they had. And he went down the list and said, okay, y'all say that this God does this, but let me tell you, the one and true God, he gives us all life. It is from him. And we are made in his image. We are made like him. And you see, that just went right along with their philosophy. Mm -hmm. So many of them believe that, well, in fact, uh, um, the six most beautiful women of the world, of the Grecian world, were celebrated because one of them actually was supposed to have a, a son by a Grecian god. So this went right along with their philosophy. He complimented them. He didn't talk down to them. Next thing, he explained that the one true God that they had a memorial to and led discussion and gave them more understanding and pointed them to Christ, the proof by the resurrection. Now, some of them, obviously, some of us today still struggle, but we believe by faith that Jesus was raised from the dead. We believe that he now ascended to the right hand of the Father by faith through the evidence of the Holy Spirit. We know that to be true. Paul proved his point, as was his custom. We see this over and over ago. This is the way Paul's methodology was to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So verse 33. Verse 33 says, so Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, the Aeropagite, and a woman named Damaris, 
and others with them. Hallelujah. So Paul went with a conviction of the Holy Spirit with the conviction of his heart and presented the gospel of Jesus Christ in the, the most educated, the highest philosophy area on the, in the world at that time. He left there with his hands clean and his heart pure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us not be intimidated. Can we share? Can we share? People, people of knowledge, people, articulate people still need Jesus. Right. We don't get to choose who gets an invitation to the wedding feast. Right. All have the right to hear. It doesn't matter if they're educated. It doesn't matter if they're rich. It doesn't matter if they're poor, handsome, or ugly. That is not our right to determine. And Paul left there. He went out from among them with clean hands and a pure heart, but he had some, he had some success. Who was it? Who is this guy? The, what's it say? Uh, Aropagite, the Aropagite. Little research would tell you that he was the narrator and the one who determined who was to speak at Mars Hill. He was the narrator. He was the one. It's called, he was the, the position he called was the judge of Mars Hill. Wow. Isn't that amazing? The most influential man, the most, the one who had heard the most discussion, who, who navigated and, and narrated the discussion there was convinced that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Hallelujah. What a testimony. Not only him, but it also says Demarius and others also went with them. So I want to bring in closing, I want to bring you attention to two websites that I have in my notes. We watched a video um, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken of a 17 year, it's about a 17 minute video of a 20 something young man who was raised Mormon and he was on his two year Mormon missionary trip mm -hmm. and Jesus finds him, captivates his heart. It is a powerful testimony of how religion held him captive and how Jesus freed him. The word of God. The word of God. And I hope it didn't offend you, but he actually said this and quoted in his video. That's a compliment. That, no, that as he was presented before the Mormon leaders mm. that he had to uh, go before when they heard of his testimony, the Mormon leaders just condemned him brutally and said all kinds of evil things against him. And they cast him out. They accused him of being demon possessed and the leaders told him, quote, and you're even j acting just like a Baptist. And to him, it was, it was a compliment Absolutely. to him. It was a compliment to him, but for others, for us to hear it, it's not so much a compliment, but I think if you watch the video, um, it's, his name is, um, Mike. Michael Wilder of the Adams Road Ministry, it will bless you. I was in tears by the time it was over with because he learned of this of the saving grace of Jesus and not the works that get you to heaven. Right, right, right. His father was an elder in the Mormon church and his mother was a professor at BYU. So this was not just a family. This was not just a young man that was that didn't. Uh, that just fell into the Mormon religion. No, he was very. He was educated. raised up, suited, groomed for this position. Right, and he found, and Jesus found him. Jesus found him. Jesus found him because a bap He went and tried to uh, convince a Russell. Baptist minister Russell. and his whole entire church to become Mormon, and the reverse happened. Hallelujah. Um, it's an awesome testimony it is. of the power of, of truth 
The power of truth. The That's power right. of truth. Yep. Truth divides. Yep. All the way to the bone and the marrow and the heart conditions of a man. Let us rightly divide the word of truth. Can we study to show ourselves approved? Will we be accountable for our own edification? Amen. Amen. We love you guys, and we thank you for being with us tonight as we share our hearts concerning the Bereans and the customs of Paul and why Paul went this way. And let we prove that it was his heart according to these two scriptures in Romans. So, Father, thank you for your word. Hallelujah. Thank you that your word is truth. And I just thank you, Father, that as we sit and read and ponder and pray and research that you give us wisdom, I just pray that we will never lead these precious people astray. Right. I pray, Father, that you will always check our spirit if we are teaching false teachings and not the truth. I thank you, Father, that these precious friends of ours on Facebook and on uh, YouTube will be diligent to search out the word. And we will be humble if they come back and say, Jared, Barbara, I don't believe you're right. Look at it this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we welcome it in Jesus name. We thank you, Lord, for your thank word you, and for your time. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for driving this. Uh, teaching home, and may we all become Bereans in the name of Jesus. Amen. Those watching on Facebook, Facebook, uh, if you'll send us a email, we'll be glad to include you in the weekly notes that we publish, and we just welcome you to join us weekly on our Zoom class. But we don't know that you want the notes. Do you let us know? You can private message me on Facebook. All right. Blessings. Blessings. Good night. We love you. We'll see you next week.